All right, so let's talk about gases. <clears throat> you notice this is not your, this is not my usual intro screen because this slide set was not made from edited versions of the publisher. It was in, inherited from a former chemistry professor. And I thought it was pretty good. So I said, you know, why reinvent the wheel? So I just modified it a little bit to suit me. <clears throat> so we talked about early in the semester, we talked about the difference between gases, liquids, and solids, and did some general characterizations of those uh, phases. But now we want to get into gases in a little more detail. There we go. Um, gases, we consider gases in, in reality semi independent particles. Um, that just means that uh, they behave. There's Angel on. They behave uh, independently most of the time. When they encounter one another, then there may be some attraction or some repulsion. And that's the real gas. We're going to identify ideal gases later, but we're talking about, um, well, they're, okay, there's another reason that they're semi independent. They're so far apart. I mean, even though a small amount of gas will have billions of molecules or billions of atoms in it. Uh, compared to liquids and solids, they're just, they're lots of open space. It's distance between them in comparison to their diameters. There's lots of space in them. So they, um, uh, as compared to gases, uh, liquids and solids, their close encounters are much less frequent than you would find for liquids and solids. Okay, there are some assumptions that we have to make about gases, um, and some of them are because we don't have the ability to make detailed measurements or account for every molecule in the gas. So um, some of these are that the gas particles are very rapidly moving, and later on, probably next Tuesday, we'll do a calculation and say just how fast are they? That, that's coming. Um, they're rapidly moving. Gases are miscible, infinitely miscible in one another, which is another way of saying that when you put two gases or more together, you always get a homogeneous mixture every time, which also is called a solution. <clears throat> and the reason for that is there's plenty of room for everybody. There's lots of room in gases for other gases to mix. Gases do have mass. I mean, the individual particles do have mass, which means since they're moving fast and they have mass, they have kinetic energy. Theoretically, we can calculate the kinetic energy of individual particles in the gas. All we need is know their velocity and, and a direction, of course, and their mass. And we can calculate the kinetic energy of the individual molecules. The problem is there's so many of them, and, and they're so small, um, other factors enter in, and it's difficult to nail them down. So we generally approach this problem from a, an averaging standpoint. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, and we have to assume um, also, because that there's so many gas molecules in a sample, and we don't have the computing power or the measuring power to identify each one and where it's going, how fast it's going, we have to assume that all their motion is random. And that's just for practicality. Okay. So in, in the process of studying gases, we're going to look at how the different gas laws work. 
and how they interact with one another. Gases, uh, from a physical standpoint, you need to know four quantities to completely describe a gas. You need to know its pressure. We'll, we'll define that. You need to know its volume. You need to know its temperature. And you need to know how much of it there is. How many moles. If you know these four qualities, quantities, then you can completely describe the gas. And for all practical purposes, one gas is as good as another one. Because we're talking about physics here. We're not talking about chemical reactions. When you put two gases together that uh, have an affinity for one another, yeah, you can get a reaction. But right now we're focusing on the physical characteristics of gases. And one of the reasons I like to do that first is because it's easier to get a handle on it. Plus, it's historically significant. Um, modern chemistry, when it was first getting going, modern science for that matter, was interested in uh, the physical world. And they first began their serious investigations on gases. And that was for practical purposes. I mean, they, the reason they started on gases was, for one, gases all seem to behave the same way. No matter what kind of gas you got trapped or studying, um, it's going to act the same way as any other gas. Um, and another reason is their instrumentation was available for studying gases and not so much for studying liquids and solids from a scientific standpoint, quantitative analysis. So gases were it to begin with. <clears throat> we're going to talk about ideal gas behavior. Um, and for all practical purposes, Gases at these conditions, room temperature, uh, near one atmosphere pressure, you can treat gases as if they were ideal. Now, I need to define what ideal means, of course, but that's coming. And then we'll talk about deviations from the ideal behavior. <clears throat> um, these gas laws were the first descriptions of gases. Remember, laws don't say why things happen. It just says this is what happens. And then uh, later on, probably next Tuesday, we'll get to a discussion of, of theory, a theory that explains why the gas laws work. But these gas laws can be rearranged in any number of ways, uh, just like any equation. Right? If you know all but one unknown you can solve for. It. And that holds for the gas laws as, as well as any other um, equations, mathematical equations. Now, why are we interested in the modern sense? We're interested in gases for a number of different reasons. Um, Earth's atmosphere is just one of them. Uh, we're breathing a solution of several gases, primarily nitrogen, dinitrogen, and oxygen. Those are the major components. And then you have some minor components. The, the next most abundant component in uh, atmospheric uh, the mixture is argon. And then you have some even more minor components like carbon dioxide, methane, some other gases. Um, the gas that we breathe is necessary for life, not just for animals, heterotrophs like us, but I think more importantly for autotrophs like uh, green plants, algae, those that trap the sun, sun's energy and fix it into some usable product that we can use or consume. So in that sense, um, we need the oxygen, of course, and the rest of the gases are kind of superfluous. But for green plants, carbon dioxide is food. They take carbon dioxide and water, and, um, and the 
energy from the sun, and they they fix that carbon and hydrogen together in a form that stores energy. So the EPA's effort to uh, label carbon dioxide as a pollutant, I think, is is uh, in the first place it's disingenuous. In the second place, it's it's actually dangerous. When you label something as essential to plants as carbon dioxide as a pollutant, and you try to regulate that, then you know plants or nature, they're just gonna do what they're gonna do. If you start cutting out their carbon dioxide, they're not gonna be as productive. In fact, there's there's ample evidence uh, in the scientific literature for the necessity of carbon dioxide and the ability of increased amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to also increase plant productivity. So if we're gonna feed more than three and a half billion people on this planet, um, we need to make more food. And you need carbon dioxide to do that. Um, okay. Now, there to be sure, there are other gases in the atmosphere that are definitely pollutants you know, that shouldn't be there in significant quantities. Um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, one of them, like freon, those types of compounds are very detrimental to the uh, upper atmosphere. They act as catalysts and they degrade the ozone layer. That's true. And the ozone is an extremely effective absorber of ultraviolet radiation. So that's one thing that protect, protects the lower levels in, in animals like us, plants, from too much ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. Um, and there's some other pollutants, but uh, we're gonna pass on that for now. I'm not gonna talk about global warming because I think it's far, it's, a, it's more political than it is scientific, let's put it that way. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about those four conditions, uh, four factors that we need to describe the gas. And uh, the first one that science was fixed pretty well was volume. It was fairly easy to uh, measure the volume of a gas. Right? So the volume was, was already sort of grandfathered in when science came around. All they had to do was standardize the measurement. Next was pressure. So they needed a way to define pressure. Um, and one of the earliest attempts at quantifying pressure was um, invented by this uh, Italian, Evangelista Torricelli, in the middle of the 17th century. He invented the barometer and it measures pressure. Now, by definition, pressure is a force per unit area. That's just a fact. And you pick the units of force and the units of area to define what your pressure is. Um, but Torricelli needed a, a, a practical, simple, reliable way of measuring pressure, and he was interested in the air pressure in particular. So he invented this device and he used a liquid in a tube. And um, I'm sure he thought of using water because water, you could get pure water fairly easily from the lab, but you could also get mercury very easily. And the advantage to mercury is it's 13 and a half times denser than water. So if he had used water in this device, the length of this tube would have been 33 feet long. That's, that's impractical. So he said, okay, mercury is a common, commonly available element in those days, except some people thought it was had the health benefits and they, they consumed it. Um, but what he did was <clears throat> um, he, I don't know if he was a glass blower or not, but if he wasn't, uh, glass blowing was fairly well developed uh, skill, and straight tubes of uniform diameter were readily available, especially in Italy at this time. 
were well into the Renaissance then. Uh, and he uh, sealed off one end of the tube and opened the end up. He filled it with mercury all the way to the top and closed it off with his thumb. And then he took his hand, he inverted it and submerged his hand in that pool of mercury and turned it loose. And then watched what happened. Let's see. There we go. Let's see if I can go backwards and still get that. There we go. He noticed that the level of mercury in the tube dropped. Right? It didn't go all the way down to this level. So he knew there was something holding it up there because he knew there was a mass here that had to be supported by some force. So he reasoned that the force was being supplied by the atmosphere because there's nothing else pushing on it, just air. So he said, okay, I think that the air above my current position, which goes up beyond what I can see, is heavy enough, that column of air is heavy enough to force, to apply pressure here, force here, and hold that column up. And he knew that the only thing that the air pressure was holding was that column because there's nothing in there. It used to have mercury in it, now it had nothing. So this is actually the first example of the vacuum. Okay. Now, one thing, one other thing that you'll notice is, um, well, let's look at this question. What would happen to the height of that column if that pool of mercury were a different size? You know, if it was like this or like that, what would happen to that column of mercury? Would it change height? No, the short answer is no. <laughs> and the reason it wouldn't is because pressure is an intensive property. It doesn't matter how much air you have or how much mercury surface area you have. If you increase the surface area, there's going to be more force because it entrains a wider column of air above. So you get more force in proportion to the area. <clears throat> um, unlike mass, which is an extensive property or a capacity factor, the more substance you have, the higher the mass. But this is an intensive property. And um, Torricelli recognized that. So he wanted to see what use he could make of his um, new barometer. So he, um, he did several things. He threw it in the back of his ox cart and went down to the ocean. And he noticed that the, the level uh, of mercury inside the tube went up. So he reasoned that the pressure was higher from that elevation down. He also went the other direction and found that the, the column decreased. So he knew that he was probably on to something, that he was right, that the higher you go, the less atmosphere there is above you to supply the force, and he could measure it. He also set the barometer on the table, just left it there day after day, just measured it, made marks and measured it. And he found that uh, as bad weather was rolling in, the level of mercury started to drop. And after the bad weather passed and the sun came out, it started to rise again. And we've been using that value of the barometer ever since to predict good weather, bad weather. It's called air pressure. <clears throat> okay. Uh, but we also needed a way to measure the height of that column that was consistent, that could be reproduced anywhere. And that's when the metric system came into being. And we started using as the standard the meter. And the millimeter was the preferred unit of height for this column. So they settled upon 
Uh, well, actually, there are several ways to measure pressure. Pressure is funny that way. Some units of measure are you, you're pretty well um, restricted to using certain units of measure. But pressure has lots of different units of measure. Uh, one of them is the atmosphere. One atmosphere is taken as the average pressure at sea level anywhere on the planet. Now, we know that's going to change. Torricelli showed us that. And then others, you just let your barometer sit there, and it, it, it can be right at the ocean, and it'll go up and down. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That go too fast? Okay. <clears throat> so they needed to settle on, you know, what's the average value for one atmosphere so that we could get an equivalence. And what they discovered was, well, they discovered, they agreed upon one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So one, this one unit of pressure here, one atmosphere, is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury in a Torricelli barometer. Now, I don't have one of those here, a mercury barometer, but I've got one. There's one on the uh, Greenberg campus in my chemistry lab there. And it's, it's valuable because those things are expensive and they're not very common anymore. So we have to use an electronic equivalent. Yep. I was going to say, are they more, uh, are they more accurate than the uh, yes. calendars? Okay. Yeah. The, the substitutes, uh, the electronic versions, uh, have to be periodically calibrated if you're going to rely upon them. <clears throat> So, um, oh, one other thing is the height of this column is measured from the surface of the mercury pool right here. From there to the top of the column, to the top of that meniscus. <clears throat> so, uh, if your pool is not very large, it may tend to go up and down. Right? As, as more of the mercury is pushed up into the tube, this level is going to drop. So what you need to do is have a way to adjust the level. Right? So it's at a zero point. And that a barometer on the Greenbrier campus there has, has a dial underneath it. And it, it actually pushes up the bottom of the mercury pool until it reaches this needle that's sticking down there. And that's your zero point. So if it's not on that one, then I adjust it until it gets there. Then the reading will be accurate. OK. <clears throat> So what are some other units? Let's see, 760 millimeters is one atmosphere. Uh, oh, we're gonna do an example first before we talk about other units of measure. So you may, <clears throat> you may surmise that at this altitude, which is in the neighborhood of 2,500 feet, there we go, 2,504. That 2,504 feet above sea level is the accepted elevation at the airport down the road. So which direction? Over there. Um, so you can surmise that it's probably never going to get to one atmosphere. And why do they need to know? their exact elevation in the first place. Because most airplanes use a barometric altimeter. It measures the height of the airplane above the ground, or the height, um, referenced against a barometer that's built into the instrument. So it measures air pressure, and you need a reference point. And periodically, you have to reset it. So, uh, right before they take off from the Bankley Airport, they will adjust their barometer for the correct elevation. 
and set it at 2,504 feet. Um, okay, so if we know that on this particular day, 694 millimeters of mercury was the pressure uh, down the road, then what is that in atmospheres? It's simply a matter of unit conversion. Whenever you have an equivalence, you have a conversion factor. So we put this conversion factor in there in such a way as we can cancel the millimeters of mercury and leaves us with atmospheres. Okay, so it's less than one atmosphere. Now, if you go to a higher elevation, like even further down the road to Winter Place, um, they're about a thousand feet higher. And the air pressure, um, you might surmise, is much less. So we're looking at less than 0.9 atmosphere. And you can do this all day long. Just take your barometer and measure it wherever you want to go. Um, I'm trying to remember, I've seen units measure air pressures from Mount Everest. It's pretty low. It's like in 0.6 atmosphere. It's low enough that if you're not acclimated to it, uh, you have to wear oxygen. And I think it even gives the Sherpas trouble once they get up to that height, because they don't live up there. <laughs> and um, um, athletes that are going to compete in the, another location, they check out the, the uh, height of the sea level. If it's higher than where they're training, uh, they're going to go there a couple of weeks in, in advance and acclimate to it. And they, it will, in fact, their number, their concentration of red blood cells uh, and the um, iron content, the, the carrying capacity of the blood will increase in just those two weeks. All right. And if you go down um, to, say, the Dead Sea, which is well below sea level, you'll find that the air pressure increases quite a bit. We can convert atmospheres to millimeters of mercury too. Right? But this, this conversion factor works both ways. Okay. Um, other units of measure. The international standard for pressure is the Pascal. Named, at, named for a, a polymath whose name is Blaise Pascal. I don't know if I put that in it or not. But you, you might have heard of him before. If you've had a math class, um, you may remember the Pascal's triangle. Looks like a bowling pin. You start off with a one, and then you put a one over here, and then you add these two together for the middle number, and then you put a one out there. And then you add these two, or these middle numbers, and you put a one over there. And you just keep going. That's Pascal's triangle. It shows up in uh, uh, mathematical solutions, particularly statistics. You'll see it there. Anyway, <clears throat> um, this unit of measure uh, is equivalent. It's a derived unit, in other words. The fundamental unit uh, in this equation is the meter. The Newton is a unit of force. Now, Newton itself is also a derived unit. Okay. And it's based upon force equals mass times acceleration, but a special acceleration, which is designated G. That's the acceleration of the surface of the Earth. So it'd be 9.8 something, something, something meters per second squared for that one. And then the unit of measure here is kilograms. Okay, so if you're focusing on the units, kilogram meters per second squared would be newtons. Um, and of course, that's to honor Isaac, because this is his second law. F equals MA. So uh, why do we need to know that? Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna use Pascal's in any calculation, 
um, but there are other units in there that may possibly combine with the Pascal in some way, either additive or cancel out, then you need to know what the Pascal is worth in terms of fundamental units so that you can uh, cancel units if necessary. I don't think I've got any of those types of problems for you, but I, I thought I'd mention it anyway. In case it ever arises. Okay, so we've got the Pascal as the standard, but there are a whole host of other measurements. Like one atmosphere is also equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. That's equal to 760 millimeters. Or 14.69 pounds per square inch. Okay, any tire gauge that's used to check the pressure on your tire is going to be in PSI. In fact, when we do that lab, I think next week, uh, Boyle's Law, we're going to measure pressure inside the container, our pressure vessel, with tire gauge. And it's going to read out in pounds per square inch. So you need to be able to convert this uh, pounds per square inch measurement to atmospheres. Okay, use that conversion factor. And then we'll also measure um, atmospheric pressure, which has to be added in. Uh, and our gauge in there is calibrated in inches of mercury. So you take that one and convert it to atmospheres. That way you can add them together, apples and apples. Uh, weathermen have been using this measurement for decades. I should say meteorologists have been using the bar, the millibar actually. So if you've ever seen a, an isobar, uh, map, weather map, it's got these curvy lines on it. Those lines represent equal air pressure anywhere on that line, as long as it's continuous. And then you'll have another one out here of a different pressure, and another one out here of a different pressure. Uh, and they're, they're always in millibars. So one millibar, or one bar, is equal to 100,000 pascals. And then a millibar, of course, would be a thousandth of that. Right. So it takes a thousand millibars to, um, to make one atmosphere, roughly. I used to have an instrument in the lab that I used to freeze dry plant samples. Called the fancy name is lyophilizer. But basically, what you do is freeze your sample, and then you stick it in this chamber and slam the door and start the vacuum and it seals. And you pull a vacuum and it, you go down to uh, about 10 millibars, really, really low, less than 10 millibars. So that under those conditions, water will sublimate directly from the solidized to gas. And when it does that, it doesn't damage the tissues or cause any degradation whatsoever. That's why freeze dried, I guess, First commercial application was freeze-dried coffee, Sanka, years and years ago. It was supposed to retain all of its flavor because they freeze-dried it. And they were probably right. But I wouldn't know because I don't drink coffee. Okay, so one atmosphere uh, in terms of pascals is uh, 101,000 pascals or 101.3 kilopascals. Sometimes it's quoted that way. Okay, so you can convert all day long. All you need to do is just keep track of your units. Dimensional analysis will get you where you're going. If you know where you started, you know where you want to end up. If you want to start in PSI and you want to end up with inches of mercury, then you need units of measure that will convert. Sometimes you have to chain them together. That's what we've done here. First, we convert it to atmospheres, and then we convert it to atmospheres to inches of mercury. And that many atmospheres is that many inches of mercury. Or millimeters of mercury to millibars. That's an interesting one. Okay. 
Now, when, when you actually look at a weather map and you see the, the units of measure, or if you look at what they call a weather station, have you ever seen those? They're like um, circles and then they have like a flag out here like this. Tells you the direction and the speed of the wind. These, these marks mean something. <clears throat> uh, and then positions around here, the hot information listed in one of those will be uh, millibars of the air pressure, but they use a special code. In other words, if it's less than a thousand, uh, say it's 900, then you'll just say um, let's see, I painted myself into a corner. I can't remember exactly how to do it. But since it's not important right now, <laughs> we'll move on. <clears throat> okay, we're still on pressure. Um, this whole slide is just the, to justify mathematically the fact that um, we can actually calculate the pressure of this column of mercury and correlate that to atmospheric pressure. And we use the, the diameter of the column, we use the height of the column, we use the density of the mercury, and we use the acceleration of gravity. So all those factors together go into this calculation. Right? If we have, um, let's see, where did I get this? Uh, 3.14. Uh, oh, <coughs> it's pi. <laughs> pi r squared. <laughs> pi r squared over 2 squared. So this is the diameter. So we have to take half of it and then square it. Okay, pi r squared. That's the area of your column right here. And then the height of the column will give you the volume times that. So there's the height of your column times the area of the circle. And then we uh, unit conversion because we got to get it to um, cubic centimeters for the density here. Uh, and then we have to convert it to uh, kilograms for the uh, mass of the mercury. Because pressure is force per unit area, not mass per unit area. We have to calculate the force now. And the applied force uh, is that F equals MA. Right? That's this part right here. Right? Mass times acceleration due to gravity is force, and then this is the area. And then we, um, this is Newton's, and this is square meters. And that's Pascal's. So that justifies, that actually calculates the equivalence of one atmosphere to how many kilopascals. Okay. Let's see. For about 30 minutes. I think we can. We can get to reach a good stopping point, but if I don't dally too much. <laughs> okay, now we're going to start talking about the laws, the gas laws. All right, remember we have these four conditions pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. Oil uh, was, we're going to take these in chronological order too. Oil was the first. In fact, he was, he's given credit as being the first quantitative scientist. He actually made, measured, he, he measured effects um, of volume based on the pressure that he changed. He changed the pressure, that's the independent variable, and he measured the volume as a response for gases. And um, so he let these two variables relate to one another. And when you do that, you got to hold these two constant. You can't let them change. So these have to be constant. 
in order to observe the relationship of pressure and volume. And what he found was that pressure times volume equals a constant. Whenever he measured the volume change with respect to pressure, he got a constant value, which means that as this one goes up, that one has to go down. Otherwise, you don't have a constant anymore. That's an inverse relationship. Pressure and volume are inversely related. Okay, so how did he do it? Well, let's see. Well, this is plotting the data. Actually, what he did was he, he took one of those straight tubes and bent it and produced a, what we call a J tube. This. There we go. Closed at one end and put mercury in here. And of course, it rolled down to the bottom and it puddled in the bottom down here. It's crook, crook. And he kept adding it, adding it, adding it. Eventually, it touched the inner curve. At that point, we had fixed the number of moles of gas. And he didn't know how many moles there were. He just knew that they couldn't put any more in there. That value was fixed. And these experiments didn't take very long to perform. So the temperature didn't vary that much. Or if you wanted to, you could just submerge it in ice water and he knew it would be constant. Um, but as he added more mercury, he noticed that this level of mercury here only brought this one up by how? If he added more, it only brought it up like that. He added a lot more, it only brought it up like that. Okay, so he knew that there was something in here pushing back to support this difference in height right here. So this difference in height of the mercury is, uh, I'm gonna call it pressure, because I'm gonna use the letter H for a different measurement. So this represented the pressure based upon Torricelli's height of mercury. This in here represented the volume. Whatever was left in there was volume, or he could just say height, because the, the diameter was uniform. So he knew that the height was uh, the variable or volume in this case. We took those two values together and made measurements each time he did that. Um, he found that multiply those two together and you always get a constant. Now with, uh, and that, that constant though was only good for this experiment. If you did it again, the next day, it would give you a different constant because conditions had changed. So nowadays, if we make those measurements, we'll say pressure is in atmospheres and volume is in liters. That should be a capital L actually right there. And if we start off with one experiment, we say uh, 25 atmospheres on a gas gives you four liters of volume. So the product is 100. If we decrease the pressure to 20 atmospheres, the volume will increase to five liters. And you're still getting each one, pressure times volume is a constant. And we're plotting them over there on that graph. Okay. Let's see. And you can draw a smooth line. Okay. Notice that it's not a straight line. <laughs> right. And uh, scientists don't like curves. But we can characterize this curve, mathematically speaking, geometrically speaking. That's a hyperbola. And if you remember what a hyperbola is, you can go out here to infinity. And it'll never touch the axis. And the same thing up here, never touch the axis. It can't touch the axis. Why? Because if it touches the axis on even one of these, one of them goes to zero, right? And zero times something has no meaning. I mean, it's zero. 
So then you, you lose the relationship instantly uh, in a physical sense. Okay. Um, so that's Boyle's law. But that form of it is not very practical. It's not useful. So a more useful form is to look at it in terms of um, what, what are the conditions right now? And then what happens if I change the conditions? So it's like a before and after situation, initial and final. So if we say these are the conditions now, initial, and we say, okay, I'm going to change something, change the pressure. So now we have a new pressure and we have um, a new volume. Well, what's that equal to? It's equal to that same constant. So set those both equal to the constant, they're equal to each other. Okay, and that's the most useful form of Boyle's law. When you say pressure times volume, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, or PI, VI equals PF, VF. That can be used. All you need to know is three of those variables and you can solve them. Here's an example. And when you're reading a, a, a word problem, you have to decide, is this a before and after situation? Well, what do you look for? You look for before and after. Okay, they're saying, what's the final volume? When this is the initial volume, okay, there's a clue. Something's changing. And what's changing is 500 millimeters of mercury um, goes to 125 millimeters of mercury. So we should expect what? The volume will increase by the same ratio as these two numbers, which is what? Uh, four to one, right? The ratio of 500 to 125 is four. So this one ought to increase by four times. So that'll be 60 liters. And if you rearrange, in this case, we did rearrange for the final volume and then plug in the numbers. And it turns out, sure enough, 60 liters. I got to work on that slide because those small L's are not right. So, the abbreviation for liter is capital L. All right. Let's see how we do it. Let's see. We're going to get um, us another example. And it really doesn't matter what the units of measure are, as long as it's the same. Cubic feet, cubic feet. Okay, you're good. Um, PSI, so your answer will be in PSI. With this example. And we determine what the pressure is when that, when that change occurs. Oops. So you're still writing. <laughs> Okay, uh, next one is Charles Law. Charles was a Frenchman. In fact, as is so often the case with Frenchmen, they either have two first names or two last names. Is this on um, Blackboard? On Blackboard? Mm -hmm. This one on Blackboard. I think so. Okay. Yeah. So you can sit back and watch instead of copy. Unless um, making notes like that sometimes is a good memory tool. I, yeah. whenever I'm writing notes, note, I do like word by word because then it just sticks in my head. Mm -hmm. I remember taking notes before you had all this electronic stuff. I mean, that's the way you got your information. When the instructor was talking, you were furiously. <clears throat> and uh, I often wished I had uh, taken a course of shorthand. <laughs> well, high school and all my schooling, all my teachers coded for their chalkboard, blackboard. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Jacques Charles was a Frenchman, had two first names. Um, but 
um, his work, he didn't publish his work. Um, a colleague took his work and published it. I don't know, maybe even posthumously. Uh, Joseph uh, Louis Gay-Lussac. But the reason that Charles came on later than Boyle's is because um, in Boyle's day, they didn't have a reliable way to measure temperature. It hadn't been invented yet. So once they had a, um, a system and instruments that would measure temperature, then we can investigate temperature relationships or uh, gases. And in this case, we're looking at uh, volume and temperature relationships. So these two are going to be our variables, and these have to be constant. Pressure and moles. So one way to do that is to just have a cylinder like this and a piston there, and you have some force here. Maybe just a kilogram weight. And this has to be a good seal, of course. And once you've established that, then the amount of gas in there is fixed. Right? There's no way in or out. And the pressure is fixed because we have a, a standard force on it. And it doesn't change. So now, all we have to do is find a way to change the temperature. So you just take this thing and submerge it in some liquid and allow the liquid to change temperature. Because uh, and that's usually some solution of water. Uh, because it has very high heat capacity, it will it'll make, it'll hold that temperature steady while you make your measurements. Okay, so uh, Charles Law simply says that the relationship of volume to temperature is a constant. It's written here as uh, volume equals the constant time temperature. I like it this way uh, because I know that the product of two variables equally constant is an inverse relationship. But the quotient of two variables equal to constant is a direct relationship. As this one goes up, that one goes up to maintain the constant. Oh, by the way, uh, I think we experienced, I didn't mention, uh, when you work on the, uh, the graphing lab, right, we had a transformation of data and they used Boyle's law. There. They had pressure times volume equals the constant. But that's a curve. We want a straight line. So how do you get a straight line? Well, you transform it. Divide both sides by V. Right? These two cancel. That leaves us P equals K over V. Or I like it better like this. K times 1 over V. So this is Y equals MX. Plus B. And B is zero. So if you transform your volume measurement into an inverse and plot it X against Y, you get a straight line. Let's see, one over B pressure, get like that. Okay. Now, back to Charles. Um, so, Charles made these measurements of various gases, and he found that uh, as he increased the temperature, the volume increased as long as he kept the pressure and the number of moles constant, then this relationship holds. You just plot the values there and notice that uh, it only works if if we're positive temperature, negative temperature doesn't work, right? Because <laughs> You introduce that negative in there, then your constant is blown up. And um, uh, Lord Kelvin recognized that, and for other reasons, thermodynamic reasons. Uh, he said, we need a temperature scale that has only positive numbers. Right? So, this, so we won't have this problem anymore. So that's when he took uh, these data and extrapolated. He just said, all right, 
if this gas is ideal, then it just should stay a gas all the way down till zero volume, just keep pressing it. And it should just completely disappear. So by uh, 1848, he had proposed, based upon this extrapolation, that his new system had a zero point of absolute zero. And every temperature was positive above that point. So that's why when you, when you work problems with Charles Law over the any temperature uh, for these gases, you have to convert it to Kelvin first. So Celsius would be, uh, Kelvin would be Celsius plus 273. Okay, and we can treat Charles the same way we did oils as a before and after condition, right? Because they're they're equal to the same constant, so the initial is equal to the final, and all you have to do is just fill in three of those, and you can solve the fourth. Let's see. If we can get through all three gas laws, that would be nice. Okay. And you can either plug in the unknowns and solve for the one you don't know, or you can solve for the unknown and then plug the value in. Either way it works. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's an example. We have a gas that's uh, initially at a volume of 50 liters at 25 degrees, and we heat it up to 300 degrees. Calculate the final volume. Well, first of all, you've got to change the temperature to Kelvin. Then you can plug in your values. And it turns out the volume, if you change the temperature that much, the volume is going to increase to 96 liters from uh, 50 liters. If you tried that with Celsius temperature, it wouldn't work. It would give you a wrong answer. Okay. And here's an example where you can, you can measure, you can calculate the temperature of gas if you measure the initial temperature and the change in volume, then you know that the final temperature has to be this value. And then of course, if you need the value in Celsius, you just convert it back. Subtract 273 from that. And you get Celsius. Okay, the last law, Avogadro's law. Okay. Avogadro was interested in the relationship between this one and this one. So these two, Pressure and temperature had to be held constant. Um, Avogadro did uh, some of this work. Much of the work that led to Avogadro's law um, was based upon his hypothesis. And I'm not sure if I've mentioned that before, it's worth mentioning again. What he said was that if you have two gases, have I done this before? Two gases with equal volume. It doesn't matter what the gases are. That's irrelevant. Two gases with equal volume. They're under the same pressure. They're in different vessels, but they have the same pressure. And they're at the same temperature. Right? Then it must be the case that the number of moles of one is equal to the number of moles of the other. That's Avogadro's hypothesis. And the value of this is that um, any difference between these two in mass is due not to the numbers or any of these other conditions, it's due to the individual mass of each of the particles. They have to be different. So if one of them has helium in it and the other one has, um, Neon, right? So this is um, 
what, 20 and 4? This is about 20. This is about 4. So under these conditions, that gas should weigh five times as much as this one because each atom weighs five times as much. Now, why is that significant? Well, it all goes back to this meeting at Karlsruhe College in Southern Bavaria. The problem in those days was that the uh, academic community and the businesses that were relying upon what was known about chemistry in those days, which was only mass, they only knew mass. When they were making products through chemical reaction, uh, everything was fine as long as they got the product they wanted and the amounts they wanted. But when something went wrong, they didn't know how to fix it because they really didn't understand what the reaction was about. It wasn't until they understood that it wasn't the mass relationship that mattered. It was the number and uh, the number of each of the elements going into that reaction. And they didn't have a handle on it. They didn't know how to, to assess the mass of each one of them. So they could relate mass to numbers, stoichiometry. It wasn't until Avogadro came up with this hypothesis and then it was further developed and disseminated by a student of his uh, named Kanazaro, who was at the meeting and uh, delivered his paper. And then as the participants were leaving, he was handing out reprints. And they politely took the reprints back to their respective colleges and, and companies. And some of them read it and just you know, light bulbs went on all over Europe. They finally had a handle on what was going on at the microscopic level. Okay. So Avogadro's law is that relationship between volume and moles. So here's another case where I, like, I prefer uh, relationship of volume and moles equals a constant, that quotient, which means they're directly proportional to one another. Right? If volume goes up, moles has to go up. Or if moles goes up, the volume has to increase. And you can say before and after for this one also, initial and final, same type of relationship. Okay? Rearrange and solve. Here's the case where we're actually going to get into chemistry and use the gas laws. So if you calculate the volume uh, where you're starting at 35 cubic feet of ammonia at this temperature, and it's allowed to decompose. So you get two moles of ammonia producing how many moles of the Product gas, four moles total. So two moles of this makes four moles of that. So the before is two moles and the after is four moles for this term right here. So if we set it up like that and substitute the values in, uh, let's see, what are we trying? We're trying to find the volume. Okay. So we need the volume to start with. The final moles, which is four, and the initial moles, which is two, then twice that is the final volume. 70 cubic feet instead of 35. Okay. <clears throat> now you may be wondering. Okay, this is great. As long as I can hold these two constant, I can study those two. But what if they're all varying all over the place, right? So what do you do then? Well, we have a solution. It's called the combined gas law. So based upon these individual gas laws, so let me put my stuff back up here. Uh, let's see, pressure volume moles. Okay. We look at the relationship. Let's start with Boyle's law. So Boyle's law says uh, pressure times volume. 
is a constant. Um, okay. What about volume and temperature? Volume and temperature is a constant too. Okay. Volume in moles is a constant. As a quotient, a quotient, a quotient. So now, all four of those together makes a constant. And you can set it up as before and after, right? Initial, 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 initial. And then over here, pressure, volume, moles, and temperature, final, 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 and final. So with this equation, you can let all of them vary. And all you need is one unknown. Anywhere in here. If one of them is unknown and the rest are known, you can solve it. Or you take this equation and say, well, temperature is not going to change. Right? And the number of moles is not going to change. So if we hold those two constant, then you've got Boyle's law. And you can do that with any other. If you can identify one of these factors as constant, then it drops out. Sometimes you may only have three factors in here, like the number of moles is constant. Then you have pressure, volume, over temperature equals a constant. That's the combined gas law. Right? And this is my animation for it. Okay. Got four minutes. Let's see if I can. So let's, uh, let's define an ideal gas. We're going to come back to that combined gas law. Maybe not today, but certainly next Tuesday. Unless you want to read ahead. You know, that's all you look. <clears throat> so what's an ideal gas? Um, well, here's some circular logic for you. An ideal gas is a perfect gas. And a perfect gas is an ideal gas. So <clears throat> what do we mean by an ideal gas? <clears throat> I mentioned it a little bit earlier, a minute might have blown by too fast. But Lord Kelvin assumed that gases were gases all the way down to zero volume. That's an ideal gas. It never becomes a liquid or a solid when you prep, when you compress and cool it. Now we know real gases do. Carbon dioxide, if you compress and cool it, it becomes a solid. You know, dry ice. Um, but an ideal gas remains a gas under all conditions of temperature and pressure. We also assume, uh, based upon that assumption also, means that um, our, our gases have point volume. Right? Remember mathematics class? What is that? That point represents just that, a point. It has no width, no length, no depth. It doesn't have any dimensions. That's what we assume for gas molecules. They have no volume. That's the only way that you can get them to stay a gas all the way down to zero volume, is that they don't have volume. Now, that's an ideal gas, and we know that doesn't exist. Right. But it's a starting point. The other uh, condition for an ideal gas is they don't interact. Gas molecules do not interact. In other words, um, if they're traveling really fast and they smack into each other, they just behave like billiard balls. They just transfer momentum. Okay. They don't attract. They don't uh, repel. They just bounce. And of course, they have to obey all the gas laws at the given. Now, real gas, we know they do liquefy, they do solidify when you cool and compress them. They do have volumes. They do interact. Um, that's why some gases um, liquefy at very low temperature, and some of them liquefy or solidify at very high temperature, relatively speaking. You can get um, 
nitrogen gas to go to a liquid at minus 195 degrees Celsius. But carbon dioxide gas, you can get it to go to a solid at minus 78.5 degrees Celsius. So why the difference? Well, because there's attraction between these molecules. You can make a solid out of them at, and, and you don't have to cool them as much. They can have more kinetic energy and still remain solid. Whereas nitrogen doesn't attract as much. So you got to get it a lot colder to make it turn into a liquid. So that's proof that they do interact. Gas molecules do interact. And of course, they have to interact with the walls of the container. Right? If they didn't interact with the walls of the container, we would never be able to measure pressure. Right? You stick a gauge in there, and for all you know, there's nothing in there. If they don't interact with that gauge, Okay. Now, under what conditions can we treat gases as if they were ideal? Right. Under conditions of low pressure and high temperature. Right. Low pressure generally means that we're not trying to cram a whole lot of gas into a small space. So there's lots of room in there. They'll behave ideally under those conditions. High temperature means that they don't interact. They don't have time to interact. They've got so much energy at high temperature when they smack into each other, um, who cares? I mean, any forces between them is they're irrelevant because they've got so much kinetic energy. Now, what do we consider low pressure and high temperature? Well, actually, low pressure is atmospheric pressure or anything below that. Actually, you can go up to uh, you know, 50, 60, 100 PSI, and you can still treat a gas as ideal. Some of them, I should say. The higher the pressure, uh, the more limited your scope, the different gases that you can use. Um, high temperature is room temperature, right? Based on what? Well, our reference now is absolute zero. And room temperature is 298, 293 degrees. Kelvin, that's pretty high on an absolute scale. So low pressure and high temperatures is perfect right here. That's why we could study gases, historically speaking. Um, all gases would behave similarly because they were actually at low pressure and high temperature when scientists first started studying them. That was fortunate. Okay, we're overdue. Let's pick it up with the ideal gas equation. Next Tuesday, better mark myself, uh, which would be eight twenty-eight. Nine twenty-eight. We'll pick up with the ideal gas equation. Is it on this page? <laughs> 